Uh, thank you, George. Thanks for your warm welcome. And thanks everybody for taking the time uh, to dedicate uh, your whole being, your awareness, your kindness, your you uh, to 90 minutes of practice. And what I love to do if you have a compatible device is just click on gallery view. And maybe if you feel like just um, opening your video just for a moment and have a, have a wave at everybody, it kind of settles my, my nervous system always, kind of just see all these waving people and all these backgrounds, our sangha. <laughs> oh, thank you. And uh, as you see fit in terms of keeping the video on or off, as a matter of fact, everything that you hear in this mini retreat is all suggestion. And um, as George was saying, um, we'll have a kind of a similar structure where I'd love to invite us into some practice and then reflect on um, four words that really help me to rest and being okay with how things change in the world and how things constantly change within me. And those four words are keep calmly knowing change. I think by the end of our session, uh, those words might be tattooed in your brain. <laughs> And it can become a really helpful uh, meditation instruction, but also a way of relating to life. Because what happens when we attune to change and we're not opposing it, we're not wanting it to stay in, in any other way than it's changing moment to moment. We attune ourselves to this universal truth of change. And that's what these teachings are about, is to live in harmony with the natural law. And it's not easy. You know, you might have lost a loved one. Or I'll share a little bit about me later on. I've been dealing with a lot of health issues. It's a hard truth. And it's the one that the Buddha kind of taught us the most. He kept referring back and back again to attuning to change and to see that from there we can naturally invite a process of letting go. And so I'm new to you all. My name is Bart and I live in New York with my wife Chantal and our son Lou and um, been there for 15 years, quite a while. And right now, I'm um, in Barrie, Massachusetts. Uh, just finished a silent retreat. And um, so I'm very grateful that I can be with you from uh, this space of silence. And so let's, let's get started. And um, maybe just taking a moment to see if you need to stretch or move the body a little or hydrate it a little. Is it helpful to orient yourself in the space you're in? Let's take a moment also to check what would be an ideal body posture for the next 25 minutes or so.
Maybe we can start by just noticing what's it like to be me right now? In this moment. Maybe tuning into this human body. This human body being always in real time, right here, right now. How would it feel to soften the belly in the body? to loosen its jaw. Really taking your time to invite the body to be easeful, relaxed perhaps. Being human also comes with the experience of mind. Its nature is to construct thoughts, images, emotions. What relaxes to the body is receive and allow to the mind. Is it okay to be you right now?
Being human means being sensitive. The senses are constantly being touched, moment by moment. The sense door of the ear, touched by sound. And these sounds appear and disappear. Inviting you to keep calmly knowing the change of sound. impossible to hold on to a sound. The body sensitive to the movement of the breath. Let's check if it's helpful to keep calmly knowing body breathing, moving.
when the mind is sensitive to states of focus, sleepiness, sensitive to images and thoughts. And these mental experiences come and go, just like sounds. Keep calmly, no one change.
Keep calmly, knowing change. What's being known right now? How is it changing? You calmly knowing change.
Thank you for your practice. I'd like to um, offer some reflections on these very instructions of keep calmly knowing change. Um, because I think they can uh, really help us in being with change in a way that is more harmonious. I think that these teachings really allow us to get a different attitude towards change in life. If we remember to really feel change happening often from a moment to moment's perspective. But that's not to say it's easy. So I'd like to start with the poem that really kind of, for me, captures the, the intensity of impermanence. It's by uh, Mary Oliver. It's from this book called In Blackwater Woods. It goes like this. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal and to hold it against your bones, knowing that your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, let it go. And when the time comes to let it go, let it go. And this, this practice that we're doing of kind awareness, I think it's really all about finding out how to love well and how to let go well. I think that's really the heart of this whole practice. How to love well and how to let go well. The Buddha kept pointing to one wisdom door over and over again, and that is to really come to terms with impermanence. There's a very poignant story of his. It's, it's been said in these ancient scriptures and the discourses that the Buddha died because of food poisoning. And at the very end of his life, on his deathbed, he was asking his attendees, the, the monastics, is everything clear? Because I've not been holding back in my teaching. And their response was, no, venerable sir, it's all clear. And then supposedly, and I find this such a poignant um, moment in one's life, on one's deathbed, his last words were, all conditioned phenomena are of the nature of arising and passing. My translation, all things fall apart. And then he added his very, very last words, keep practicing diligently. I kind of almost see him make a fist. Kind of keep going, keep at it. Stay in practice. And I find this always inspiring to share these words, to hear them, to read about them. And nothing that I'll, I'll share, and probably also when we're at the part where we as a community unpack today's teachings, will be rocket science or anything new. But I think we need to keep hearing these uh, teachings about impermanence over and over again. And I also think it's really helpful to keep practicing attuning from a moment to moment's perspective to how everything changes. And so I wanna unpack, keep calmly knowing change, all these four words a little bit as a way to support maybe that process of actually relaxing into and trusting in permanence. But before doing so, I need to also acknowledge uh, the Venerable Bhikkhu Analio, who is a monk who has written a lot of books about practice. And for my teacher training, we once had to study his PhD. And his PhD was um, an elaborate study on the discourse the Buddha gave on mindfulness. 
It's a really helpful um, study that I highly recommend. But I must, you know, in full honesty say it's a pretty big book and I'm not used to reading PhDs. So I went to the conclusion. And there I found him saying, of all the instructions the Buddha offered about mindfulness, they can maybe be summed up into keep calmly knowing change. I think, you know, I love the creativity, but it's also quite powerful how he came to pick those exact four words, keep calmly knowing change. So let's start with the keep. And this already in these last words that the Buddha shared, keep practicing diligently. This is about to keep doing it. This is not a practice that we just do once and then it's okay. It needs a sense of resolve or effort. You showing up right now in this community of Sangha life, you showing up for yourself in your own practice, even showing up in the, the messiness of daily life, with family members, coworkers, friends. It all takes energy. And it's said that in these Buddhist scriptures that effort is the root of all attainments. And so there's something I find helpful and keep sometimes coming back to my motivation to keep practicing. Because it can also happen, and you're sure that might have happened for you too, that you sometimes maybe fall off the wagon and not practice so much. And I had that experience actually um, last month in March. Because last February, I, I had to um, have a, an emergency heart procedure done. And um, it went well. But the afterwards, you know, the, I had an infection in the wound and took quite a bit of time to get my energy back. I noticed that I wasn't gravitating towards practicing. Just even the thought of being mindful was, oof, not right now. And that whole month, I, I was mindful at times, but I just really couldn't get myself back to like formally doing my walking or movement practice or sitting practice. And what I found really helpful was to go back to the keep and to, to the motivation. And so I had this retreat planned here for myself for seven days of practice. And when I came here, I felt a little bit nervous. Like, do I want to be with my body and myself again? Because the heart now beats a little different and I'm still having some side effects from the medicine. But there was something of a trust. It's like, you know, what's been motivating me is knowing that this is helpful. Let me try just a little bit. And I just sat for 10 minutes in the chair not giving myself a big project. And slowly, slowly, without the need of having to attain anything, the keep started coming back. I started to see that, yeah, a moment of mindfulness is already helpful, but more moments actually feels like, ah, oh, a homecoming. And what's even more helpful was then I started actively reflecting on thinking back on why do I do this practice? Why have I been doing it for more than two decades? And so I just want to pause for a moment and ask you just to reflect for yourself, what keeps me practicing, what keeps me motivated? Why am I doing this practice? And just settle back for a moment.
And every time when we remember to be present again, we are strengthening that muscle of keep to continue practicing. And when I did that recently, I had this memory of an insight coming up. And I remember once I was doing in a, in a more of intense retreat, I was doing walking practice in a forest and all of a sudden I stopped. And I turned attention to my body and it was breathing, it was sweating a little bit, it was pulsing. And it turned to the change of that. Then I attuned to hearing. I really notice how sounds are constantly coming and going. Then I looked at the trees and I saw the leaves rustle. Everything that was in my sight, there too change was happening. And even when I would turn to the mind, and I love how the Buddha calls that a sense organ too, the mind, it was being touched by thought, emotion. And then these words came to me, trust impermanence. I'm not sure if you've had that experience where all of a sudden you see something differently or you have an insight and there might be an image or a word that really frames that experience. For me, it was trust impermanence. And that's been such a helpful um, guiding principle now for me. And I remember coming home to New York and my wife's supportive, but she's not a meditator. And she goes, so Bart, how was your retreat? And I go, wow, Chantal, it was great. And I had this huge insight. She goes, tell me. I said, it's helpful to trust impermanence. <laughs> and she looks at me and she goes, oh, okay. What's for dinner? <laughs> you know, sometimes these, if for us, it's really special, but maybe for another person, it's just two words. But I highly recommend when you are really witnessing something and it's meaningful to you to often listen to that voice of maybe intuition or an image that might come that really helps you frame that. Because what I did when I was about to go into um, this heart procedure that I had to do was let me try to remember this insight. And so I got quite nervous just before I had to get off my bed that I was laying in for a while and walk into another bed, like a floating bed in the operation room. And I thought to myself, let me just say trust and permanence trust and permanence. So I could feel myself walking and it's very humbling in these gowns with your open back. And I lay down and I was just really well attended by very kind and professional people. And even when they started giving me the anesthesia and I could feel that it would make me a little woozy and a little nauseous, and fear would come up a little bit. Let's trust in permanence. Keep calmly knowing change. And it, it just helped give me a sense of like, can I surrender now? And of course, also with the anesthesia, that, would, that, that helped. And it did. And so this is... Is really kind of a plug for kind of the diligence of practice. That we balance both relaxation and diligence in practice. I also want to talk a little bit about calmly. Keep calmly. And that word, I think, is well chosen too. Because it kind of points to how we are relating to our experience. Because I'll be honest with you, I came out of the operation and I thought, oh, this was quite 
pleasant actually. I didn't feel any pain. I was probably still under the influence of the anesthesia. But that soon wore off and pain kicked in. And then I thought, let me just name the pain and go pain, pain. And especially when the care was, it wasn't being cared for as much as in the beginning. My wife had to go home. I had to go to another room and the pain started to become quite intense. And I just noticed that in my way of naming the pain, which is another form of meditation that we can kind of make a gentle note. It was like pain, pain. And I started really having the teeth on one another. It was like almost a grinding. I can do this pain. And then I just settle back and go, how am I relating to this pain right now? And just that question, it made me very tearful. It made me open up to a sense of sadness that I wasn't seeing. There was a, a realization of, hey, it might not be the way it ever was. This, this condition in this body. And so to calmly, keep calmly, is also about knowing how is the mind relating to experience. And so I'd love to pause one more time in our mini retreat and just to ask you right now, with the diligence of keep, to get a sense of what are you aware of, Maybe it's the body breathing or specific mind state of being sleepy or calm. How am I relating right now? What's the attitude right now? Sometimes that question is just enough. It brings that sense of like a calm receiving again. Sometimes it's illuminating. Oh, there's resistance or impatience. Letting that become your object of kind awareness. Keep calmly receiving, but also curious. Because as soon as I regained also that sense of curiosity and practice after a month of resisting it a little bit, it started to flow again. So let's talk about the knowing, keep calmly knowing. And the knowing refers to awareness, it refers to mindfulness. Once I was um, shadowing a uh, martial arts and meditation teacher in East Harlem, this is years ago, and he has a dojo. And they would do a lot of practice with the uh, young people there. And I kept noticing that Stan Kohler is his name. He would never use the word meditation, mindfulness, knowing, or awareness. You know what he called our practice always? <laughs> and the boys too? Psychic self-defense. Psychic self-defense. Because it has a protective quality, this knowing. 
the Buddha actually called it a spiritual power. This ability to know what you are experiencing and to recognize it and to meet it without opposition or favoring, just as it is. And I think this knowing can become a refuge. But it needs practice. Because otherwise that it just becomes an idea. Yeah, I should meditate. And I love this from Ajahn Sumedho. He says that, and he's a, a, a monk in the Thai forest tradition. He says, awareness is your refuge. Awareness of the changingness of feelings, of attitudes, of moods, of material change and emotional change. Stay with that because it's a refuge that is indestructible. It's not something that changes. It's a refuge that you can trust in. This refuge is not something that you create. It's not a creation. It's not an ideal. It's very practical and very simple, but easily overlooked or not noticed. But when you're mindful, you're beginning to notice it's like this. It's like this right now. When you're beginning to notice, it's like this right now. And so sometimes in my meditation, I'll just ask this very simple question, especially when I feel distracted. Is there awareness? Is there awareness? And then realizing already here. We don't have to make our awareness created. It's already here. As soon as we remember. And does it feel like a refuge to you? I think the freedom that can come from really being and resting in awareness is to realize, and this I, I had in the hospital too, that the moment when I realized that I had so much sadness in me, that the part of me that was knowing their sadness, that part was not sad. That part was simply knowing. And I also find that what in this teaching of Ajahn Sumedho interesting that everything that we experience comes and goes, but the knowing of all that has like this indestructible, almost constant quality if we remember. And then so lastly, the changing, keep calmly knowing change, the changing nature of things. This is a very powerful teaching from the Buddha. He says that better than 100 years lived without seeing the arising and passing of things is one day lived, seeing their arising and passing. The Buddha is placing this huge emphasis on really becoming easeful in harmony with the law of change. Because even if we were to reach 100 years, we will still face the fact that we have to let go. So this practice is teaching us to let go well.
And I think this is this is not an easy practice necessarily to kind of keep pointing to it. But the Buddha actually suggested to do it on a daily basis. And he had this, this very pithy uh, line that he suggested as a daily recollection, recollection. He would say, this body is subject to aging. It's of the nature to arise and pass away. And I am not exempt. And he went on. His body is subject to illness. And I am not exempt. This body is subject to death. And I am not exempt. This wasn't offered as kind of a gloomy way of looking at life. I think it actually can be such a powerful recollection because it puts their things in a very different perspective. But it also might give us hope because things are changing sometimes in ways that are not going in the right direction. Not just our physical health, but climate change, rampant racism, the way people from the community of the LGBTQI are being treated, patriarchy. Yet things constantly keep changing. And I think that if we are aware of that, we might also start to see what Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen monk, used to call that because of impermanence, everything is possible. Because this practice is inviting us to be active and engaged, but coming from an understanding and wisdom of that things change might actually allow to fight in a different way for racial and social injustice, to fight against it, not from a place like it's always been or from a place of holding on. Because what becomes crystal clear when we keep calmly knowing change is that holding on makes no sense. And this morning, for my community, I was having Joseph Goldstein as our guest teacher, and he was sharing that if we hold on and we hold on to a rope, the more tighter we cling and someone pulls that rope, the more it hurts. And I think if we can kind of keep practicing, seeing that things do change moment to moment, we might catch the moment of holding on faster. And even realizing that when we struggle, which we will, or when we resist change in our lives, that that struggle and these, this pain changes as well. Keep calmly knowing change. I'll pause there and also would love to invite you into what my dear friend and colleague Leslie Booker calls wisdom democracy. And just inviting you to see if there's anything that arises for you, how have you been with change or ways to hold impermanence or any other question or reflection that is you're most welcome to share with us. And you can just raise your hands or use the uh, icons and then George will reach out and invite you to uh, share or you can also do that through the chat. I just love to kind of broaden our perspective with just in this voice on how to be with change. Thank you.
So, does anyone want to have a question? And raise your hand or ask it in the chat box. I will read it to Bart. Um, but Sue was uh, asking, what was the book, the book from Ajahn Sumedho you quoted from? Because he has a few books. I don't know if it was The Sound of Silence. Or... Oh, um, that was from a book called Intuitive Awareness. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really like that quote. It, uh, it not only points to changing, I mean, to, to looking at change, but it, it also makes us interested in, and me interested in, what's it like when I know I'm aware? What's that like? Sometimes people would say, you're mindful of mindfulness. And that is that didn't re resonate for me. But when I pause, I can know the experience. Let's say right now, cold feet. But I can also know that I'm aware. And that's what that quote kind of invites me into. Like becoming interested in the experience of mindfulness itself. And when I can rest in that, that does feel like psychic self-defense. It's like I'm, I am feel like protected by this knowing. And it has a, an indestructive feel. And, um, I always get very enthusiastic and to, um, to keep practicing and really appreciating the moment of being present. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also opening uh, the chat. Uh, just going through all these kind reflections of gratitude and um, yeah, there's someone sharing in the chat that the answer of how to cope with pain can be found within the pain itself. I just love to invite us all to pause with that for a moment. The answer of how to cope with pain can be found within the pain itself. I think what's arising for me, and I'd love to hear reflections from you too. What happens when we turn awareness to painful sensations? What can we learn then from being aware of pain? And I don't think it's always easy to then just stay with the impermanence of it. I think sometimes it's also helpful to maybe withdraw a little bit, or retreat from the pain. If I look back, and I was also sharing with my, my dear teacher, with Joseph, about this period of not wanting to practice for a while. I think I, what I needed was being more aware of things around me and so much that I would, the pain in the body. I wasn't ready to feel that yet. And the Buddha calls that skillful reorienting mindfulness. I think this is a really helpful thing, especially if you go to the process of grief or a lot of pain or chronic pain. There's so many other senses that are being touched that we can also attune to. And so what I've been doing a lot, and in hindsight, now that I'm sharing it with you, it feels, does feel like practice, is being aware more externally. And I've seen, for example, how 
spring has sprung in New York. And even here in the woods of Massachusetts, that just in a matter of days, all these bugs arise. <laughs> and all of a sudden are there. And so I think sometimes we can learn a lot from the pain. But it can be also helpful to notice if it may be too much. And then maybe just notice, oh no, I've touched it a little bit. Let me bring awareness somewhere else. And to see that as part of practice too. And when I was sharing it also with my teacher, you know, he said that that too is practice. And so it really made me realize again that practice can never be compartmentalized in one way is good and one way is bad. It's all practice. But it's important that we keep remembering it and keep being open to being aware. And then when we do can be with the pain a little more, that is really freeing too. Because then we can maybe also start to see that Oh, at first, my attitude was one of resisting the pain. And then to notice that there's some freedom in feeling the same emotional or physical pain again, but with a mindfulness that is right in the middle, not opposing, not favoring. And even if that's just for a little bit of time, that's empowering. It's empowering to realize, oh, I just spend easeful with shame or guilt. And then maybe a minute later, you're beating yourself up again. That's fine too. <laughs> but just that moment can make a huge difference and become an insight. So I want to thank you for, Jane, for that very pithy teaching that you shared with us. And I do see a few hands. Um, yes, so Jane Miller, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. All right. Yes. I'm here. I don't see myself. Hold on. Wait, yeah. no. Can you see me? You can't see I me. Can. I can see you, Jane. <laughs> well, good to see you. Thank you very much. I'm a psychotherapist, and I guess I look at change quite differently because I see just change as growth and we all are constantly changing throughout our lives and we learn from the changes that we go through, I think. Yeah. Um, and pain, the way I help, I work with a lot of people with chronic and terminal illness. And what, what I do with clients frequently is say, okay, so where in the body is the pain? Mm -hmm. And what is that pain telling you about what's, what are the emotions? What are the feelings? And helping them release those. And then also asking what the body is needing. Mm. So it's a very embodied way of approaching therapy and somatic practices right. and really helping a person come to terms with what's underneath that pain and then how to release that motion or whatever it is. Right. And what does the body need and how to embrace that? So it's not distracting. It's not fighting it. It's embracing it as just this is part of life. Yeah. And beautiful. so I thank you. But I just wanted to say for me, change, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't calmly know how to go through change in life. And I don't right. think many of us would. We, yeah. We're survivors. We're incredibly resilient. And hopefully we learn from the past and we grow and we can be curious and, and go on this adventure and this journey that we're on. So that's just my thoughts. Thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing your wisdom, Jane. And I, I so appreciate the word curious. I think as long as, as that is there, we are open, open to how we can grow based on whatever is going on in our lives. But I think without curiosity, we might also stop practicing meditation. 
I just really appreciate it among many things that you said, Jane, but also that word curiosity that, that stuck out for me. And thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. I also see Victoria's hand. If it's yes, still Victoria, free. you can unmute. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I've actually came in late, unfortunately, because I came from another um, Zoom meeting. Um, and... <laughs> But when I came into this group, it was it was um, it seemed it, like it was a, a segue. Um, I we were talking about self compassion and self care, and um, like skillful versus unskillful behavior. Um, I mean, in the Buddhist terms, and something that came up that I'd love for you to speak to because we didn't we didn't reach any conclusion was. Um, about the idea of martyrdom. I mean, I know that's a big topic, but but um the the idea that that one has to look after oneself first, which is you know clear from self-compassion and something we all struggle with, I think, in our modern society. Um it, the question is, is it is it um I mean, apropos of pain and suffering, that if one is um if one's one feels that one's existential purpose is to sacrifice for the sake of the the greater good or or someone whatever saving the life of another you know or saving the life of a child at one's own expense or whatever that sort of the these gray areas in terms of um self you know because what 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 they were talking about in the group was this idea that, that sort of a clear cut idea that self compassion has to be primary and and if we ha if the cost to us is too high when we're helping others then um then it's then it's not skillful so i just wonder if you could speak to that for a minute i hope it's not too tangential to the subject today <laughs> but sort of the you know the i i think it connects with the idea of like the the meaning that can be found in pain and suffering and how one can help others through that experience thanks right, right. Oh, thank you for that reflection, Victoria. Sounds like a really rich experience that you've had there. And um, the first thing that comes to mind is, I don't know. <laughs> and I think that is, you know, I find that always an interesting first response. Like, I don't know exactly. It's just, it brings up a lot of curiosity and it brings up questions for me. And I think that is what really, again, what Jane was also talking about in terms of the, the curiosity. Um, it kind of reminds me of taking good care of yourself, taking good care of others and both. And uh, once the Buddha was asked, you know, you know, what is really at the heart of all this? And he used that same way, he said, making sure that whatever you do say or think is not harming yourself, harming another, or both yourself and others. I'm not sure if he had an order there, but it always started in these teachings with oneself. And I think there's a reason maybe for it. And I think that's why Stan Kohler, you might have missed it, this... Um, um, Martial arts teacher in East Harlem refers to mindfulness as psychic self-defense. And I think that when we come from a place of clarity, we come from a place of self-care. I think we can way better at being skillful fighters in the world and holding space for people. You know, I'm just always amazed by People like, for example, Mother Teresa. She once said that she picked up 42,000 homeless people. 42,000 people. And yet, she was also kind of radiating and having a vibe of self-care too. So I don't know the answer to that question, that reflection, Victoria. And I think... It also depends on the circumstances. Like if, like I've recently gone through a heart procedure, an emergency operation, and I of course asked the, the surgeon 
And now I have a cardiologist, which is a weird thing to say, my cardiologist. I asked him, what did I do? <laughs> what can I change? And he didn't have a real answer for me. But what I did do was I took the whole month of March just to heal and recover. And so the, the shift was way more to me making sure that I was okay again. And this wasn't a very pretty process. <laughs> I was being a, um, how to put this skillfully? Uh, I'll say it unskillfully. <laughs> An a-hole to my wife and kid sometimes. <laughs> And I'm grateful that, you know, they held the space for me as I was going through all that. But I think then there will also, again, be times, and there have been times in my life, where I feel like I'm okay and I can really be present for others. It kind of makes me think of that analogy that the Buddha often gave in terms of the middle way. What is the middle way here? What is, you know, just that asking oneself that question, you know, What's the balance? And even with, you know, we've, we've explored keep calmly knowing change. Keep calmly. The keep has an element of effort and maybe, it, you know, a healthy striving. And the calmly is the love and the kindness to balance all this, the receiving of it. And there too, we need to find a balance in our practice as well. Because our, our energy level, everything within us and around us constantly changes. And so in order to be with it, we need to attune it in, an, in a skillful way, as you were saying, um, Victoria. Yeah, so I rest in not completely knowing this. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. And uh, George, I'm, I'm also seeing such beautiful reflections in the chat. Yes, and there's, a, there's a kind of a question from Lawrence says okay. what's underneath the pain but from a buddhist perspective isn't that so different than direct experience of embracing pain can you repeat that oh yeah what's underneath the pain oh i see it now too okay yeah what's underneath the pain i'll just read bart from a buddhist perspective isn't that so different than direct experience of embracing pain I think uh, the underneath, for me, Lawrence, it could be the attitude. How is the mind relating to the pain? And I think there's a process in that, in your reflection and in your question, because maybe first there could be the recognition of a painful feeling and experience. That's actually, or an unpleasant, the Buddha would say. It's a very helpful thing to see because then we can learn also, how do we respond to pain or unpleasant feelings? We learn from our own um, habitual responses. And you know what the one is that the Buddha said the most? And this could be underneath pain, like an underlying tendency. And that is to go for the pleasure. The Buddha calls sometimes a person who is not practicing an untaught worldling. I like that, untaught worldling. And I'm in that mode sometimes, quite a bit. And I realize when something is unpleasant or painful, I go and look for comfort. You know, that's what we do. And so from a perspective of the buddhist teaching is just to see that oh i'm going again for extra crunchy natural flavor potato chips when i'm bored in the evening or more netflix i'm just bored i don't know don't want to be with the unpleasant boredom and i think so to recognize this and that the underneath might be all this conditioning is very powerful and then the embracing, as you also shared, Lawrence, the embracing could be and maybe just seeing it all and maybe attuning to how that changes. 
You know what the most powerful thing is, I think sometimes in practice, especially when it comes to pain, is just to realize that even in pain that seems to be there forever, change is happening. And as Jane was saying about, you know, how we can grow from it, is that empowering experience of, oh, I've, I've been able to hold this. I see a change in the way I'm holding this pain or this grief or this impatience. Yeah. Thank you for that reflection, Lawrence. So, Bart, if I may, I've, I've been trying to hold myself here, but if I may, I would just try, like to share a bit because yeah. this has been a very powerful um, um, session for me. Just because, as I had the opportunity to tell you before, I was, yeah. I am going through a grieving process. And one of the things that I've been battling with, with is the way my practice has just gone down the drain, my former practice. But listening to you was, I, of course, I already knew this, but it's so difficult to acknowledge it. The fact that I, I, I embrace the, the grief, which comes in tides and waves, and sometimes it diminishes, it, sometimes it comes, and of course the mind comes and says, well, this is the worst part of the process, but now it's getting better. And that's when it just comes battering again. And the fact is, I've been quite calmly navigating through it, just allowing the grief to be and to cry and to explore it. And then I realize by your words, what we've been exploring tonight, that in fact, that is my practice now. Yeah. That is the practice. And it's in, in most ways, the practice that I can do and that I need to do. And of course it has, um, it's the reflection of a whole pack of other practice that has been going through the years. But now this is the moment to practice this in this way, you know, just, and it's very interesting when I was listening to your words and say, oh yes, that's it. Because I can feel the moment the pain arises and the sadness and the grief comes like, you know, just something that is sometimes overwhelming. And yet I can see it, which is quite amazing because you just not only feel it, but you see it coming and you see it feeling and you see how the body reacts and what it needs to do. And it's quite extraordinary, uh, quite extraordinary. So, um, I'm, I'm really grateful for this session because it was kind of um, the acknowledgement of um, something that is going on and I'll just let it go and flow as it goes. Mm. Sorry mm. for taking this time. Thank you. Oh, no, no. And maybe we can all just pause for a moment. And I already see expressions of that. Just also for you holding your grief. and. You know, for the passing of your mom. And I think if you like, we can expand that just a little bit and we also create space and kind wishes for other beings. Holding the pain of grief, of loss. And to know that we're not alone. We can find not only refuge in this indestructible knowing, we also can find refuge in nature, in friendship, and in community.
knowing that from the web of life we cannot fall. As I pause right now and attune to the time, I'm also aware of it being time for us to slowly come to a close. And I just want to really thank you all for your kind presence and inviting me to offer my reflections and you all listening deeply also to my the personal things that have been gone through and Really appreciate your presence, your kind wishes. Know that we're part of this ever-flowing cycle of giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. And I'm just so appreciative that everything that I've received today from you, George, and from Sangha Live. And you know, if you are in a position to support song alive i hope that you get great joy from doing so and uh i think if it's okay i'll i'll ring a bell is that okay for everybody to just ring a bell and let go and um one thing that uh my teacher Joseph Goldstein says often when he rings the bell is that the whole of the Dharma can be experienced in just attuning to the changing nature of the bell sounding. And so be maybe one last time together to keep calmly knowing change as I ring the bell three more times. And just see what happens. May there be peace. May there be peace. And may there be peace. Thank you. Maybe you want to unmute and holler. Feel free to do so. <laughs> if I'm being curious. Nibar, thank you all, friends. Bye -bye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May there Thank be you, peace. Yes. <laughs> Shante, Shante, Thank you, Bart. Shante.